Okay, thank you. I'm very pleased to be here uh, to talk with you today about some of the research that I've done uh, relating to all these issues. Um, so let's just, let's just get started with it, okay? Uh, so the title of the talk is Parenting Time, Parent Conflict, and Intimate Partner Violence, okay? Effects <clears throat> on Children's Emotional Security. So let me just tell you my approach. I'm a developmental psychologist. And what I'm interested in is how children experience and understand things that happen to them. So, you know, as, as child psychologists, we want to get into the head, into the mind of the child to see the child's perspective. Right? So that's the approach I've used in all of my research uh, having to do with these issues uh, that we're talking about today. And my approach is how, how does parenting time... And how does the child's exposure to parent conflict, how do they work to affect the child? I mean, we all, you know, sort of, kind of, we know that, you know, having time with a parent is important. And we know that, you know, a child exposed to parent conflict is harmful. But when you, I think we really need to look and understand the processes by which those things work, because that's the best way to inform policy. You need to know how a system really works in order to repair it. So that's the approach I use. And there are three main sort of processes that, that are working here. And one is what we call emotional security, and that's the child's sense of security in the family. And this goes right back to infancy in what we call attachment, the development of the infant's attachment to the caregivers. And it's a lifelong process. Um, that um, is the, the child's sense of security with the family and with the parents. So that's sort of the psychology of it, but the modern research is, is able to relate the child's psychology and feelings of emotional security and insecurity to the physiological stress system that we all have. Um, a common term for it is the fight or flight system. When you're exposed to threat, your body releases powerful hormones that prepare you to defend yourself. And um, so this is the common underlying system. We call it, we're getting under the, under the skin, into the, the brain and the neuroendocrine system um, to see how the child's emotional security is... Um, triggering stress responses. And most of the modern research focuses on the, stre on the stress hormone cortisol. And uh, we've measured that in our studies also. So it's a good indication of what's happening to the child. And the most, sort of the third link in this chain is long-term health, both mental and stress-related physical health. The public health literature going back to the 1960s has consistently shown that beyond things like, you know, um, alcohol, smoking, um, you know, nutrition, obesity, uh, lack of exercise, all of these things that we know are related to long-term chronic diseases, in addition, our parent-child relationships and exposure to parent conflict in childhood uh, over and above all the, all the known other suspects that um, are, are threats to health. And so these, these stress-related mental and physical health problems are really an immense uh, cost to society because decades later they play out in, in even loss of time at work, but of course you know, mental and physical suffering, um, the stress, the stress hormones like cortisol will um, interfere with the immune system. We all know how important that is nowadays. Um, it can interfere with child growth and metabolism. It, it's related to certain types of cancers. And, you know, high levels of this, of the, this kind of emotional security stress are also related to early mortality. So we all know that stress kills, it really does. And um, 
we are able to see the relationship between the child's emotional security, the stress system, and long-term health. So if we're talking about the best interest of children, this is undeniable because this is not something you get over. <laughs> um, early stressors in related, related to the family, it's, it's something that persists, tends to persist throughout life. So that's the approach I take. Um, let's see what we're doing next. So what, let's just talk about emotional security. What do we mean? All right. Um, so I'm going to talk about emotional insecurity now. So here's a child. What, what do children worry about? All right. What are the sources that are of their emotional insecurity? Well, one source is parent-child relationships. Child could be in, can have insecurity about me and mom. And the, the question we found, the way to really measure this, that is, is really the child's wondering, do I matter to mom? Same thing with dad. Insecurity about me and dad, do I matter to dad? All right. The child is responsive to both relationships. The child can be secure with both, insecure with both, or insecure with one. Right? We see this going all the way back to infancy, in early infancy, in the first year or two. Infants are as likely to be securely attached to mom as they are to dad. And when infants are secure to only one of the two parents, it's no more likely to be the mom or the dad. All right? So this is based in biology. It's based in our, you know, our, our history as a species that babies become attached to the, to the people that are caregiving, giving them care. Doesn't matter what gender or sex those caregivers are. All right, so we really see this. The third source of emotional security, insecurity here, is insecurity about parent conflict and violence. All right, just as important as the child's relationship with each parent is the child's exposure to interparental conflict and violence. And we, we can measure this nowadays, and there's been a lot of research done on the effects of parent conflict and violence, and, and it comes down to lingering feelings in the child of vigilance. They're always in a high-conflict family. They're waiting for the next fight, right? They're vigilant. They're on edge. Um, when the parents are fighting, the child's likely to feel that, to be worried about being abandoned. I mean, if mom and dad are fighting, one of them just might leave because they can't stand each other. So the child, from the child's point of view, it's who's going to take care of me, right? And this, is, this is what's going on in the psychology of the child's exposure to parent violence. And also, obviously, fear of safety. If they're fighting, if it's, and if it's a violent interparental relationship, of course, the child's just basically fear, fearing, fearing for their own uh, physical safety. So, it's so important to, to always keep in mind these both sources of potential emotional insecurity. I'll just show you um, sort of an example from one of our studies. So just look at the, at the yellow boxes, OK? So in this particular study, we were measuring security with the father-child relationship and also insecurity about parent conflict. We have ways of measuring both of those. And you can see that both of them affect the long-term physical health. All right? This is a statistical model. These are statistically significant effects. But the, 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 the simple message is that the more secure the father-child, the child is, the more secure the child feels about, do I matter to dad, the better the child's, uh, the young adult's long-term stress-related physical health. And similarly, the more insecurity the child feels about being exposed to parent conflict, the worse the child's long-term physical health. Both of these things are happening. In all of these issues, you have to keep both in mind. There are some times when groups or policymakers or my colleagues in academia Focus on parent conflict and protecting the child from parent conflict. And that's absolutely important. But they might forget the, about the security in the parent-child relationship. 
and vice versa. When we're talking about policies for parenting time and equal parenting time and shared parenting time, it's easy to focus on that and, and kind of forget that uh, it, the, the child's exposure to parent conflict is equally important. So that just shows, to, to, to have, ho hopefully be able to keep these two things in mind, you'll see in the left hand, um, you know, uh, light green boxes, parenting time is positively related to security in the father-child relationship, and we're going to be talking about that, right? But parent conflict um, is negatively, the parent conflict, more, the more exposure to actually the parent's conflict increases the insecurity the child has about the conflict, so that's, that's pretty obvious. So I want to focus on parent conflict right now, so, and we're going to come back to the slide and then and focus on parenting time. But, so first of all, there's good evidence that parent conflict causes emotional insecurity. Right? Researchers have been studying the effects of parent conflict for decades. Now, of course, we cannot do a you know, randomized, controlled, uh, you know, experimental study of the effects of parent conflict, but the research has been able to show how it works. It's been able to look at the child's physiological responses to parent conflict. We have so much corroborating evidence that parent conflict, you know, really, you know, with a high degree of confidence, causes this kind of insecurity. All right. So, given that, what do we do if there's a high conflict family? What do we do about parenting time? Okay. So here's. I'm just going to jump right to some of our findings. So let me walk you through this slide. First of all, at the very top, severe parent conflict families, 270 of them. So this is by the parents' report, that their level of conflict was very high before, during, and five years after the divorce, so right in that time period. Okay. We know that parent conflict decreases after divorce, but this is looking right at, at the, uh, the five years of just around the divorce. And on the vertical axis is the insecure, the child's uh, insecurity about the parent conflict. So higher values means more insecurity. And down along the bottom, you see um, categories of parenting time. This is the amount of parenting time the child typically had with father during the divorce childhood. Okay? So you can see, and uh, when the child's basically not seeing the father, right? Child's not worried about the parent conflict because, you know, the child can't be afraid of it happening at some point because the child's only living with mom. Child's not worried about whether, you know, dad will abandon me because child's not seeing dad. So that makes perfect sense that for this type of emotional insecurity, it's not present if the child's only living with mom but you'll see that it does increase from about 10% parenting time, 20 and 30, the middle, the middle times there. So now the child's spending time with dad, most of the time living with mom, exposed to the parent conflict, and that's when the child is insecure and stressed by it. But notice, at 35% parenting time, the insecurity about the conflict spikes. Right? I'm trying to think about that. So now the child has a meaningful amount of time at dad's house. <clears throat> if the conflict drives dad away, that's going to disrupt the child's daily life. Right? The child may be exposed to more interactions between the mom and the dad at 30% parenting time. Okay? The child has more to lose. The child is probably more vigilant um, at 30% about 30% parenting time, but notice that equal parenting time, equal parenting time seems to buffer the child's insecurity about the parent conflict. And we think this makes sense because if I have two equal homes, my parents are fighting with each other, neither one's likely to abandon me because they're invested. <laughs> I'm spending a week at mom's house, a week at dad's house. It's not like I only see dad every, you know, five days. If you're only seeing dad every five days and the parents are fighting, you have five days to worry. Is he going to show up again, right? 
So it's very interesting that we see that equal parenting time seems to buffer children against the emotional insecurity that they experience in high conflict families. Right? Okay? Now, we've just recently looked at families where the child reports, um, these are actually young adults reporting that they witnessed intimate partner violence between their parents growing up. All right? Now, if parent conflict causes emotional insecurity about that conflict, then exposure to um, interparental violence should cause the same type of insecurity. And we find very similar, a very similar pattern here. Let me just say one word about, uh, about this, that you know, in the past, when people studied high-conflict families, there were very few people sharing equal parenting time. Right? So all you had to, to observe was that red line going up and stopping at about 30%. And so policymakers and researchers all concluded that in a high-conflict family, more parenting time causes more stress. But we didn't see what happened with equal parenting time because not enough people were doing it. Okay, so this, I think, tells us something very important that we didn't know before. <clears throat> so when we talk about parent conflict and the policies based on, those were good policies in, in many ways based on what we knew then. So that's a way to approach this issue, that now we knew something else. You know, some of what we did before was misguided. It's, we can, we can fine-tune it and make it better now, okay? So let's look at uh, intimate partner violence. So these were, this was a large study we did with community um, families, and we asked the children to report on, on the amount of uh, intimate partner violence they had witnessed. So, so what about parenting time in intimate partner violence families? So this is just some basic information about the rates of interparental violence. So on the left side, you see the scale where uh, the, the children reported, I, I never saw them, one parent hit the other, going up from once, twice, once a week, almost daily. So that's our scale, right? And we have four, we asked about four, four types, four instances. We asked about how often did you see your father commit violence against your mother before the divorce? Father against mother after? mother against father before the divorce, and mother against father after. I'll just say a quick word when, when in our research, when we've asked both the mother and the father to report on instances of, of violence, they actually agree. Um, so we, we do really in-depth interviews privately, and we find high agreement um, about the, the frequency and who's the perpetrator. The, the, two, the two groups that are in red, mother, father before and mother before, those are in red because those are the only two instances that actually had relationships with the child's long-term stress. So it was the child witnessing the violence before the divorce that impacted the child's later stress. So that we're just going to focus on that. Quick, quick little... I, um, Description of the rate, so you can see that the average was less than once for father committing violence to the mother before the divorce. Um, that's the whole group average uh, of the several hundred uh, families. But it was actually 28% of dads were witnessed to have committed an act, at least one act of um, hitting, punching, you know, domestic violence toward the mom before the divorce. So 28%. After the divorce, uh, the father's rate went way down, and only 10% of dads were reported to have engaged in an act. But mothers before the divorce were similar to fathers after. Only 70% of moms were witnessed by the child committing a physical act of violence against the father. But after the divorce, um, oops, did I do something wrong here? Um, 27% of moms were um, observed by the children to have uh, committed at least one act after the divorce. All right? But it's, the, it's the, the both types of 
violence before the divorce that had an effect later on. And both types were statistically significant, controlling for the other. So each one affected the child, whether it was child witnessing father or witnessing mother, which is really consistent with the idea that all of these things affect the same physiological system. So let's look at parenting time. Um, so we're just going to take those 28% of fathers who were observed to have committed one act. So if they committed any domestic violence towards the mother before the divorce, how much emotional insecurity did their children carry with them um, as a function of the parenting time? And what we see is the same pattern. What we see is that it's the same pattern as when we ask, did you just experience parent conflict? The same pattern when we ask, did you see any acts of, of physical violence? And that is that, again, equal parenting time seems to, be, seems to buffer the child. Uh, and this is in the case where the child has witnessed the father committing uh, an act. And when we look at the mother, when they reported you know, the 70% um, of mothers who had committed an act before the divorce. Again, we, we see pretty much the same pattern. Here I've, for comparison, I've put the blue line, which is when the, the, the children reported that I never saw mom hit dad. The red line is when I saw mom hit dad at least once. And again, you see um, what looks like a buffering effect of equal parenting time on the child's insecure psychological insecurity about seeing mom and dad fight, okay? right? It's just, again, it's just the stress the child feels about that. It's not whether the child was involved in it or harmed. That's a different issue. This is the psychological stress. So in the case of equal parenting time, there was no statistical difference uh, uh, between the families where the mom had committed one act versus none in terms of the child's insecurity about parent conflict. Right. So this is, we, we, I, I try to get at the child's experience from many different ways, and this was one way of looking just at conflict and then at violence, and we see the same pattern with parenting time. And again, it looks like equal parenting time is buffering. So now let's switch, actually, to looking at parenting time and emotional security. So here's where you have to really do some mental gymnastics. You have to switch now. Now we're not talking about the child's insecurity about parent conflict. We're talking about now the child's feeling of, do I matter to mom? Do I matter to dad? Right? Which is a separate source of emotional insecurity. Both are equally important. So now we're going to look at the father-child relationship and the mother-child relationship, regardless of whether they're fighting with each other. Okay. So the <clears throat> question is, of course, so this is just, again, a, re a reminder. So we're talking now about parenting time and its relationship to security in the, in the father-child relationship. Right? We've done the bottom part. Okay? So, of course, the real question here is, you know, does, does more parenting time really cause the father-child relationship to become more secure? Right. That's, that's the important question if you're talking about policy. If you're talking about we need some laws that presume uh, equal parenting time, you want to make sure that it actually causes it as far as we can in social science. Right? And before we changed the law in Arizona, I had done a, most of this research, and it was compelling enough to support a policy um, just like we have policies to protect the child from conflict, we have enough evidence now to have similar policies for shared parenting time because both policies will work together to improve children's health. So um, there are really there are actually now seven different types of evidence that support a causal role of parenting time improving the father-child relationship. All right, and I'm going to walk you through those quickly, but let's just stop for a minute and think about if that makes sense. Why would spending 30% of time with dad versus 10% make the child feel like I matter more to dad? Why would spending 50% time with dad 
and 50 with mom make the child feel like I matter more to dad than at 30%. Well, we've seen that children interpret time to, to mean how much the parent cares about me, right? So time together, time spent together in itself has meaning for children. Of course, you want the time to be good. You don't want dad to be, you know, uh, being a bad parent or mom being a bad parent. Um, so that's, of course, important. But the time itself is important. And I'll show you the evidence why time causes, as far as we can, as far as we can tell, time seems to really cause a strengthening of the father-child relationship, and just as well, the mother-child relationship. So here's our evidence. Go through it quickly. Um, again, on, on the left, on the vertical scale, we're measuring security in the father-child relationship. So higher is better. Along the bottom is parenting time from 10, 20, 30, 40, 50. And what we see is a linear dose-response, you call it, relation between step-by-step -step increases in time with dad, up to 50%, right? and step-by-step -step increases in the child's long-term emotional security with father. Right? These are group results. Right? There are exceptions, of course. But you form policy on the basis of large-scale group reports. I mean, right? So, um, so that's the first one, dose-response, linear relationship between parenting time and long-term closeness and security of father-child relationship. Number two, doesn't harm the mother-child relationship. That's the red line there. Uh, the blue line is what I just showed you, and I'm calling it mattering here, which is emotional security with each parent. So as the emotional security with dad rises with increasing parenting time, it's not a trade-off. The mother-child mother relationship does not suffer. Right? So that makes perfect sense. Number, point number three, this is really interesting. This is the same thing you find when you look at overnight parenting time during infancy. Right? It's no different for you know, an eight-month-old spending equal overnights at father's house it doesn't harm the mother-child relationship long-term. It's, it's uniquely associated with a stronger father-child relationship 20 years later. So equal parenting time has both of these benefits, whether it happens overnight, during infancy or later on during childhood. So that's point number two and three. So th there's a, what we see here is we're just going to see this pattern that is consistent with the idea that time tells the child they matter to that parent. Especially in infancy, too. That's when parents learn to be parents and learn about the child and, and form those early attachments. All right? So we don't see that it's any different in infancy. In terms of looking at the red line or high-conflict families, the green line or low-conflict, based on the parent's report, and this, now you've got to keep in mind, this is measuring the father-child emotional security, not the child's anxiety about the conflict. We're going to, we'll put it all together on the last slide, but you'll see. More parenting time is better, even in high-conflict families, to the extent that the level of mattering to the father that's obtained at 30% parenting time in low-conflict families Right? What do you need in high-conflict families to get that same level of mattering? You need 50% parenting time. So conflict, the red line is lower than the green line. Conflict harms the father-child relationship. It's hard to be a good parent. Right? But nevertheless, more parenting time is beneficial for the father-child relationship, even in high-conflict families. And in fact, it's probably more important to have shared parenting time in high-conflict families, which goes against, you know, 30 years of common wisdom, right? But we've, this is what we find, and it makes perfect sense in terms of child development theory, attachment theory, and what we're learning about the child's stress response and long-term health um, 
we're really, we're really there. And, but that's not all. Um, even when the court imposes equal parenting time, we still see the same benefit to the father-child relationship. That's the blue line. The white dotted line is when the parents agreed to that amount of parenting time. The blue line is when the courts imposed um, six to seven overnights in a two-week period, so that's equal time. From the child's point of view, I don't care how I got here. I'm at dad's house and mom's house equally. I don't care. <laughs> Who decide the parents might, you know, have to be persuaded and shown how to work it out. But we're talking about child development, we're talking about biology. We're talking about basic child psychology and the stress system, which is the way it works. Now, we, there's sort of a a pos there's kind of a natural experiment when one of the parents moves away. Right? We've studied this a lot. We're probably the people who studied this most, and very few people actually have studied this. But, you know, the, the, the main question is, should mom be allowed to move away with the child? Right? What about dad moving away without the child? Who's worried about that? Right? Turns out they have exactly the same effect on children. Right? And the effect is that when the child is separated from the father, either by the father moving away and the child staying in the home, or the child moving to a different place, and the child, it's not the child moving. It's the separation and the reduced parenting time with dad. And what we see is quite dramatic. Relocations that happened before age 12, either way, mom moving away or dad, were linked years later in adolescence to reduced perceived mattering, so reduced emotional security with all three parents, the father, not just the father, but the mother-child relationship suffered if there was a relocation. And when there was a stepfather, that relationship was also stressed. Right? Years later, those children reported higher levels of anxiety and depression and serious behavior problems. Right? So when you stress, when you disturb the child's emotional security. It's not that they get over it easily at all. And you can see the lingering effects of that on the child's mental health and physical health. So in this case, relocations are supposed to happen to better the child's life, right? We've never seen, we've never seen any benefits associated with the families that relocated versus those that stayed together. Never seen any any higher, better. Anytime we see a significant result, it's in the negative direction. All right? And again, it makes perfect sense in terms of theory. I've listed all the, the studies down here, and I'll just say, you know, I'm, I'm skimming over lots of studies. If anybody's interested, I'd be happy to provide the underlying um, publications. Finally, this is the most, this is the newest thing, and we're um, <clears throat> writing this one up. This, this, is, this should be a game changer. It's a state of the art method of answering the basic, most important question here. Um, the, prop, the question is that, you know, we can't do randomized experiments on parenting time. How do we know that parenting time causes better relationships? You know, we can't do randomized experiments on parent conflict, but we know that parent conflict causes harm by the same type of reasoning across patterns of studies. So in this case, you know, the, the research on parenting time is much newer than the research on parent conflict. We've had plenty of years of understanding how parent conflict harms children. We can't lose sight of that, right? But we're now at a point to, you know, we have enough research on parenting time to get to the same level of certainty. So, but the, so the question to answer is, you know, the alternate hypothesis, maybe it's the good fathers who get the shared parenting time, and that's why their children are doing better. So maybe it's the father, not the time. And that's what we always have to worry about, right? And um, if that's true, then we don't want to make a policy where we're encouraging shared time among everyone because if it's, that won't work for the, you know, for the not so good fathers, if, okay? So what we're able to do now is, <coughs> okay, yeah. So what we have now just recently are, you can see a new, really state-of-the-art methods in terms of statistics and methodology in the social sciences. Um, 
that allow us essentially to control for the Father's personality and then look at the within family changes in parenting time from one year to the next and whether that is followed by changes in the quality of the father-child relationship, sort of controlling for the good fathers, controlling for the well-adjusted children. All right? So when you measure this longitudinally across years, parenting time can change from one year to the next because of relocation, because of new relationship, job changes, all sorts of things, right? So parenting time can go up or down. Does that have any meaning for the child? If now I'm seeing dad more, does that, is that accompanied next year by a stronger relationship, conversely? And that's exactly what we see. So I'm just going to like, you know, put that up there and so you can say, wow, Fabricius really knows what he's doing. <laughs> this is our statistical model. This is what we call the trait versus state longitudinal method. You know, I work with colleagues who really understand this stuff, and it's, it's right. <laughs> so here's, you know, you see the boxes across the top. This, that's when the child is 13, then 14 and a half, then 16, and then 22, right? So it's longitudinal. And essentially, this blue line, that's how you control for sort of the good fathers versus the naturally good fathers and the naturally well-adjusted children. Take that out, control for that, and then you look to see if the red lines are significant, and they are. And that's, that shows that that's what is the indication of a causal effect from time with dad next year to the child's feeling that I matter more or less to dad. So, Changes in time with father in one year lead to changes in mattering, feeling like I matter to dad, one and a half to four years later, regardless of the father's personality, the child's temperament. So this is the state-of-the-art evidence we can get nowadays in social science to uh, infer causality. And the important thing here is that you don't see statistically significant arrows going in the opposite direction. So it's not that, you know, good father-child relation, you know, the child being well-adjusted and feeling like I like dad, that doesn't lead to increased time with dad, right? The child's not able to increase or decrease time with dad, right? It's if the time changes, then we see the child's feeling that I matter to dad change, and it goes like this which is exactly what you'd expect if it's causally affecting it, right? So along with the dose response relationship, the relocations, reducing parenting time and leading to these stress-related outcomes, I mean, all of that is very consistent and this is um, sort of the capstone. And so what do we have? Put it all together. What's the best approach for high-conflict families and, and low-conflict families in terms of parenting time? and in terms of understanding the child's stress response system and um, its effect on health. So I think this is what it is. So if you look at the red line, that's what we've seen before. That's the closeness of the mother-child relationship as parenting time increases from zero to 50-50. The red line is high, no problem. Doesn't harm the mother-child relationship. Again, even in infancy, we been worried that, well, if the infant spends time at dad's house, maybe that affects the attachment process happening with mom. No. It just benefits the attachment process happening with dad. I mean, you know, sometimes I get discouraged because it just seems like it makes common sense. But, you know, we've had to do the research. The blue line is the increasing security of the father-child relationship up to 50-50. And the black line is that anxiety about parent conflict that peaks at 30%, but then goes down at 50. So it seems that 50% parenting time with fathers gives the best combination right, of higher emotional security with both parents, parent-child security, and lower 
insecurity about parent conflict and intimate partner violence. Right? And that's the argument we need to make in terms of best interests of the children. This, this, these, this, these, these insecurities play out in long-term physical health issues. Um, so I think this is also important because we can't lose sight of both types of emotional security. You cannot argue for equal parenting time without keeping an equal focus on parent conflict and child's exposure to violence, and vice versa. We should all be able to come together, <laughs> right? Because it's the child. All right, thank you. Thank you very much, Fabricius. You're welcome. This was, this was great. This is really what we needed, you know. Uh, and, you know, this is what we feel. And now we've got the scientific uh, support from, from Arizona in America. <laughs> uh, now we got a few minutes for questions. So okay. if there are any in the uh, floor who wants to pose questions to William, please come forward. Uh, you know, the, the program is tight, so don't, don't linger too much before you come with the questions. Yeah, here. Thank you. I'm George Johnson. I'm a member of Norwegian Parliament. I just have a question because my, my, my feeling or my experience and understanding, it seems like when you have, let's say, 46 to that, 40 with the father, 60 with the mother, it should be okay. What? I'm sorry, what? Uh, Four to six? Time with the mother and the father. You know, if you have 60% time with the mother and 40% with the father. Okay, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, at least many people I talk to in Norway too, they, they believe that that should be okay balance. But it seems like. It seems like, based on your studies, you have to have at least 45% or almost 50 to it's really... It's just, just think more is better, up to 50-50. Mm -hmm. In some families, 30%, if it's a low-conflict family, mm -hmm. and mom is very supportive of the dad relationship, maybe that's fine, right? But in general, there's, an, in general, there's not a leveling off, there's not an elbow. Mm -hmm. More is better, and especially in high-conflict families. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Yes, there was one over here. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, <laughs> William. Um, you, one of your slides, you talked about uh, overnight time with fathers yeah, yeah. in infancy. What is the age when you use the, the concept of infancy? Is it birth? From birth. One month to, we, we, our study was from when the parents separated at birth or were separated before the child was born. That first year, then the second year, and the third year, so it was under three. We, we, found, a, you know, we, we found a sample where the separation had then, and it didn't matter whether you know, equal overnights were beneficial even when the child was under one. Thank you. And it was... That effect of the in overnights during infancy carried through when you controlled for the parenting time the child had during childhood and adolescence. So you couldn't make up that lost time during infancy in terms of the father-child relationship, um, which is really consistent with attachment theory, that the child's developing these expectations and this emotional security during, especially between about six months and 18 to 24 months. And um, what gets laid down then has an echo mm -hmm. for a long time. My question was also related to that. Um, do you have enough statistical data to say that uh, concerning the, the really smallest? Because I guess in mm -hmm. Norway that would never happen. But, mm -hmm. but you yeah, have... Do you have enough? Yeah, it's published. It's yeah. statistically significant. Yeah, it took us a few years to get a big enough sample. But um, we had, it was really interesting, if you want to know, we had the mothers and the fathers, 20 years later, report how many overnights the child had during infancy. Now you think, well, who can remember? We emailed the mothers and the fathers separately. They agreed beautifully. <laughs> on how many overnights the baby had during those first three years. It turns out you don't forget that. Right? And then we asked the child at age, these were college students in this case, at 18 to 20 years old, rate, tell it, rate your relationship with your mom, your relationship with dad. So we had the parents report 
of in parenting time during infancy. The parents report of how much conflict and the young adults report of my current relationship with my parents, and that's what we find. So. Very good. Yeah, you next. Uh, yes, I would uh, like to ask you about the, the cultural aspect. I mean, your, mm. your, your research is based on American numbers, the American culture, which is also very diverse depending on East Coast, mm -hmm. West Coast, Arizona. Mm -hmm. uh, when it comes to the role of parenting, and now we're talking about Scandinavia, what I find very interesting is that sort of the, the hot topic which Don Swim is doing, the very important work, is, is very important simply because we do believe in Norway or in Scandinavia equal rights, that we really have the best policy of shared parenting, and we are, we are failing tremendously. But what's your question? And then I'm asking, when you do your search, research, do you see this based on culture, how it differs from mm -hmm. America, Australia, Central Europe, Scandinavia? Um, Latinos? Not, not your results, because I, I see your point. Yeah. Oh. Now, when you look at, at lots of international studies, when you, when you have the data to look at parent-child relationships and parenting time, you see, you see that relationship, okay? In Arizona, we've done our studies um, in Arizona and California, and half our sample is Mexican-American and half is Anglo, and we see very little differences. Um, there's, there are different cultural practices, but in terms of the child feeling like I matter, to mom and dad and how that plays out in health, don't see many changes because... But then again, who are the parents of conflict? And culture. One thing is the result of yeah. time is important. Mm -hmm. But then the conflict, does, does that have a different sort of expression? We, we, no, we've, we've looked. Mm -hmm. We've looked to see if the, the arrows and the paths are different for Mexican-American versus Anglo, and it's very seldom that they are. Yeah. Okay, we go on. Last question. Yeah, hi, my name is Henrik Kamerash Levien, and I'm a member of the board in Mansforum, and I've been also reading your research with uh, eagerness and uh, the debate, and I have also actively engaged in it with um, professors, etc., in Norway. Mm -hmm. And the really the big issue debate that we have tapped upon here is that there are two aspects. It's the conflict aspect that it often use, yeah. and also the one with the smaller children, like you're talking about, from birth to mm -hmm. three years. Mm -hmm. and that's really where the debate stands in Norway now, that mo more or less all or most think it's a good after three years, but some of the conservatives that are conservative in terms of this research <laughs> claim that it's not enough evidence, mm -hmm. uh, especially mm -hmm. before three years or especially from zero to two years. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and there, your research with Fabricius mm -hmm. and Sue comes in, etc. But how can we tackle that uh, that debate and show the research and also show that to policymakers and um, family van control, so research psychologists after divorce, mm -hmm. um, to improve that be because it's a big debate in Oregon. It's had recently been published mm -hmm. in our core. Yeah. The the other the research on overnight parenting time is is very small and not a very good quality. And ours is the only study that looks at long-term effects, right? But if anybody wants to do this study in your universities with your university students, I can give you the, the, the uh, surveys. Um, it's just a matter of, you know, the students emailing each of their parents and then the students filling out. It, it, you know, you could do it here. See if you get the same result. Great. You should, yeah, okay. Great, right. uh, last question. No, 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 oh. uh, last question. Uh, has this research resulted in any legislation changes in Arizona or elsewhere in America regarding? In Arizona, yes, and, and 2013. Yeah, tell us. Passed unanimously. Yeah, tell a us. Very conservative state. <laughs> um, I, I chaired the committee that, um, we brought ev all the stakeholders together, right? Legislators, mental health people, court personnel, court directors, domestic violence groups, absolutely were at the table, fathers, organizations, and uh, we spent a couple of years and we decided to be evidence-based. 
And, um, you know, when you present the evidence, and exp- the important thing is explaining how it works. You know, parenting time, okay, that sounds all right, but maybe, you know, people think, well, if the child is carrying a suitcase from one house to the other, that must be hard. When you explain how at the level of emotional security and children's health, I mean, we found that especially the judges, they're, they're intelligent people, and they don't really have a stake in the game, right? They're having to f- confront these families. They were very receptive. You know, I think the research allowed the judges to decide on the basis of their sort of intuition that both parents are important. You know, we found that the public opinion highly favors equal parenting time. And I think when we presented the research to the judges, they were, they felt, you know, empowered to act on that. And it was fairly easy to, to uh, convince the judges. And they started doing it before we even changed the law. But uh, 2000, Arizona was 2013. It's basically a presumption for equal time now. And the, the family court system, the whole community in the state is very happy with it. There's been no attempt to change it. And they're actually proud of it. Uh, we're, gonna, we're making a film, actually, to, uh, to distribute about you know, um, you know, how it works, how you can individualize it, what are some of the issues, well, how do you bring parents along. Send it to Norway. I We're just kidding. Show. And then it took five years after that for Kentucky <laughs> to pass a similar law, yeah. but not, that was 2018, and not, you know, not yet. Uh, or have there been any others? Yeah. So I'll let I'll let you moderate yeah, the questions. Well, well, yeah. Well, thank you very much. And uh, so uh, what we can say here is that you, we know that the Democrats in America they say look to Scandinavia as regards progressive politics. You know. Yeah. Right. Yeah, right. Arizona. We in this room will say, look to Arizona, <laughs> you know, one nil. Thank you very much. Right.